Good morning and welcome to worship from Bagshot Methodist Church. I'm Mike Bostead, a local preacher in this circuit. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. We join together in our opening hymn, Long Ago Prophets Knew. There I was, the servant of the Lord, stepping well and truly out of my comfort zone. I don't want you to think that it was easy, dropping everything and taking on this responsibility. But it came naturally. It felt right. The timing of it, that was a complication, certainly. I sensed that the angel knew the gravitas of the task he informed me of. He knew it would change our lives forever. Take 
Joseph, for instance. We couldn't imagine carting all of his tools on the road with us. Could he really be a carpenter on the move? Besides, people trust their local tradesmen. Even if he could produce his usual quality of work away from home, would anyone be inclined to buy it? It's a tricky time for us, financially and emotionally. Any new mother would have felt the same, I'm sure. The difficulty is, new mothers almost always have their own mothers with them. It's just how we do things. One generation caring for the next. Family is integral, absolutely essential. And here we were, travelling to somewhere I'd never been before, and where my Joseph knew no one. We just needed to get over those initial problems. Then we knew everything would be all right, God willing. This is Mary's song. Oh, how I praise the Lord! How I rejoice in God my Saviour! For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and now, generation after generation forever, shall call me blessed of God. For the mighty Holy One has done great things to me. His mercy goes on from generation to generation to all who reverence him. How powerful is his mighty arm! How he scatters the proud and haughty ones! He has torn princes from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry hearts and sent the rich away with empty hands. And how he has helped his servant Israel! He has not forgotten his promise to be merciful. For he promised our fathers, Abraham and his children, to be merciful to them forever. I can't tell you the wrench of knowing my mother would never hold my newborn. She'll meet him, of course she will but not as a newborn. He'll have grown by then. We have no idea when we'll actually be able to get together as a family again. Technology helps, of course. There are so many ways to communicate. Video calls are a pretty good way of keeping in touch. But nothing substitutes having your arms around someone and breathing them in. My partner is stressed as well. Once his furlough ended, his whole career went up in the air and still hasn't landed. I keep telling him not to worry too much. There's more to life than money. But the rent does need paying and food banks can't provide everything. I can't wait for all of this to be over. Relationship is everything. We just have to get through this, and everything will be all right, God willing. Loving God, we lift the children to you and their families, aware that this is a strange time for them, not what they had planned, but they are loved and held by you. We pray for your blessing on all those going through major life changes, whether joyful or painful. We ask for your blessing on each one of them, in your precious name. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of our lives and Lord of all, we come before you in praise and adoration. From the dawn of time, your creating power and your bountiful love 
brought the universe into being and filled this world with life. From the first stirrings of human consciousness, you made yourself known to your people and provided for our needs. Through your covenant with Abraham, your law giving to Moses, and your message through the prophets, you guided us in your ways and revealed more of your plans for our redemption. And when the time was right, you came to us in your Son Jesus Christ, born as one of us, to show us the extent of your love and open the way to salvation. We praise you for his coming in humility and love to bring grace and mercy for all. Loving Father, we confess that we do not deserve the gift of your Son. We have failed to show his love in our lives. We have often been preoccupied with our own concerns and have ignored the needs of others. We have clung to familiar ways and resisted your call to change. We have been quick to criticise and slow to offer support and encouragement. We have tried to solve our own problems instead of seeking and trusting your guidance. Have mercy on us, Father, we pray. Come to us afresh in Christ and help us to live as his faithful disciples. In his name we pray. Amen. The Birth of Samuel The First Book of Samuel, Chapter 1, Verses 9 to 20 Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their, their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. An angel tells about the birth of Jesus. God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, You are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, Don't be afraid, God is pleased with you, and you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of God Most High. The Lord God will make him king, as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel for ever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, How can this happen? I'm not married. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come down to you, and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a son, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, I am... And the Lord's servant, let it happen as you have said. And the angel left her. Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. May it be to me as you have said. I've obviously never experienced pregnancy except as an observer. So I find it hard to imagine the thoughts and emotions of a young woman finding that she's going to be a mother for the first time. Perhaps excitement and nervous anticipation perhaps trepidation about what the physical impact of the pregnancy might be on her, an awareness of the responsibility of nurturing new life, and wonder at the way we're made, perhaps a fear of what it would be like to give birth, 
and maybe feelings of inadequacy and not being properly in control of things. And all of that when the pregnancy is planned and wanted as it was for Hannah in our Old Testament reading. But for Mary in the Gospel reading, it was also an unexpected shock. Mary probably had plans, plans for a, a joyful wedding celebration with family and friends and then setting up home together with Joseph and supporting his work as the carpenter. Probably she would be hoping to have children and raise a family together. And then suddenly this encounter with the angel Gabriel threw all of that into disarray. She wasn't ready for a baby yet. And the realisation that there was not going to be that big happy wedding. And coping with the shame and the stigma of being an unmarried mother to be. And though she didn't yet know it, there were further disruptions to come. The census that required them to travel to Bethlehem when she was heavily pregnant and the lack of accommodation when they got there and lack of the usual support that there would have been from the other women in the family and the community for her to give birth. And then the threat from King Herod to the new baby and the flights to Egypt with Joseph, where they had to live as refugees for a few years. From what little we do know of Jesus's childhood, things did eventually settle down after a few years to a normal family life. But then 30 years later, it all went completely crazy again for Mary. From Luke's account of the Annunciation, Mary receives this news quite extraordinarily calmly. She's very phlegmatic about it. Initially, she was troubled as to why the angel had come to her. But then when he's given his message, she just asks a single question to clarify what she's been told and then simply accepts her new situation and all its unknown implications. May it be to me as you have said. And in this bizarre year when all our plans have been thrown into disarray, we can perhaps learn a lot from Mary's reaction to this unexpected and disruptive news. As humans, we like to plan out our future. We like to have things to anticipate and we like to be ready for what may be coming our way. But we're learning at the moment not to be too wedded to our plans, not too fixed in our ideas of what's going to happen. We're having to be open to unexpected events. It would be foolish and dangerous if we were to try and insist on doing what we normally do at Christmas and seeing the people we normally see. It's going to be quite different. We need to realise that we are not masters of our own destiny and when we try to set our own course through life we can very easily be thrown off course by events, whether it's by God intervening directly as it was with Mary, or by human wickedness and folly, or by natural forces. Stuff happens and it's important for us to accept that we're not in control of everything that affects our lives. We need to have the humility to see that our plans are not the most important thing. Our lives are in God's hands and so we need to turn to him for guidance. He is Lord over all of this. That's not to say that everything that happens is in accordance with God's will, of course not. I don't believe for one moment that this pandemic has been 
inflicted on us by an angry God. From what I can see, it seems to be a, a combination of natural forces in this fallen world and human folly. But he is Lord of all. And whatever situation we find ourselves in, he is able to guide us and enable us to come through it. Mary realised that. And like her, we need to recognise God's sovereignty over all things and trust our lives to him. What that means in practice is having to adapt to changed situations. It means being flexible and willing rather than stubborn and resistant. The word obedient is often used of Mary and it means more than just not breaking God's commands, not disobeying his word. It means submitting completely to God's will and God's guidance in all things. May it be to me as you have said. Many of us find change difficult. We're comfortable with the familiar ways and wary of anything that's novel. But change has been forced upon us this year and perhaps somewhat to our surprise, we have adapted and learnt new skills. How many of us thought a year ago that we would be videoing ourselves and putting our worship online? And even though we instinctively want to resist change, we're actually quite adaptable when we need to be. And so we should hold on to that lesson when this pandemic is over. We continue to be open to God steering us in different ways. Because there's a danger of thinking that all of this disruption is temporary and that we will soon get back to normal, back to how things were before. But time never goes backwards. The world today isn't how it was 50 or 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1000 years ago. And nor is the church and nor should it be. So we're doing things differently at the moment. And that means the church of 2021 won't be like the church of 2019. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Some things will come back, I'm sure, and it will be good to get them back, like singing together, for example. But this is also an ideal opportunity for all of us in the church to have a root and branch review of what we do as a church and how we do it and where we do it and what we want to bring back and continue and what new things we want to incorporate. We want to explore what God is leading us to and how best he can use the experiences that we've had this year and what we've learned from the challenges and the setbacks that we've had to deal with and where he wants to take us forward. Mary and Joseph had to face various challenges and setbacks during her pregnancy and through Jesus's infancy and I'm sure they gained immeasurably from those experiences and, and grew in their relationship with God and with each other. And they would have emerged stronger and more resilient with a greater commitment to God and trust in his guidance and support in their lives. And as well as support from Joseph, Mary also drew support from the time that she spent with her older cousin Elizabeth, if you read on in the chapter, and the mutual support that they were able to give each other in their pregnancies that had come in quite different circumstances and at different stages in their lives, but both unexpected. It's important that we continue to support one another through these difficult times and make the effort to keep in contact with everybody, even though we're not able to meet. 
everyone's experience of this pandemic is different. So everyone is having different reactions to the things that they're going through. But with compassion and tolerance and flexibility and patience, we can understand one another's different experiences and help each other through this situation. And we need to draw on God's support and guidance to deepen our faith and our relationship with him and have a willingness to go wherever he leads us. May it be to me as you have said. And in the meantime, there's the waiting. As a child waits for Christmas Day, as Mary waited for her child to be born, all of us waiting for vaccines to be delivered, humanity waiting for a saviour. And sometimes the waiting seems interminable and we just want to get on with things. We want to see our families and celebrate together. We want to have singing and parties and crowds and sport and concerts. We want God to put everything right with the world and sort everything out. But God's time is not our time and his promises will come to fruition when the time is right. And until then, we must be patient and embrace the waiting and the hope and the promise of better things. As the angel said to Mary, you will give birth to a son. He will be great. His kingdom will never end. But she had to wait until the time came for him to be born and wait for him to grow up and begin his ministry and wait for him to conquer death and come into his kingdom. And we're still waiting for Christ's return to bring all things to fulfilment and establish his reign. But it's an active waiting. It's about following where he leads us through the darkness and the struggle and embracing the challenges and the opportunities that there are along the way, trusting his guidance and support. May it be to me as you have said. This part of the story ends with a mother's embrace, a moment of joy and peace. But more challenges lay ahead for Mary and Joseph, as they do for all of us. This will be a very different Christmas. And we don't know what next year will bring. Things will never be quite the same again. But God is with us. And that's all we need. Amen. We come to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we come before you with our prayers for your world and its needs. We give you thanks for all the good gifts you have blessed us with, but most of all for the gift of your Son to be our Lord, our Saviour and our friend. We thank you that in every circumstance of our lives, he is there beside us to guide and uphold us as we seek to do your will. And so we bring to you the concerns that are on our hearts, trusting in your wisdom and mercy. We pray for the nations and peoples of the world, seeking a way through this pandemic that will protect people's health, well-being and livelihoods. Give wisdom and integrity to those in government and their advisers. Give skill and stamina to all medical professionals and carers. 
and give patience and forbearance to all of us as we consider how to spend this Christmas season safely. We pray for politicians and negotiators from the UK and the EU seeking to agree the terms of our future relationship with each other. Guide them to a mutually beneficial solution that will enable all parties to prosper. We pray for all who are sick or troubled or in need at this time, and for those who have recently been bereaved. Pour out your healing and restoring power on them, we pray, and show us how we can support and uphold one another through these difficult times. We pray for the Church and its leaders, and for this congregation gathering virtually in our own homes. Help us to maintain our worship and fellowship, and to remain faithful to you whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Shine on us the light of Christ. Fill us with joy at his coming, and make us willing to follow where he leads. For we ask all these prayers in his holy name. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is Timothy Dudley Smith's setting of the Magnificat, Mary's great song of praise to God for choosing her to bear his son. We sing the hymn, Tell Out, My Soul, the Greatness of the Lord. For our music tonight, we're in Belfast Cathedral, and our first hymn speaks of Mary's joy when she discovered she was to give birth to Jesus. Tell out, my soul, the greatness of the Lord.
and so may the peace and joy of the Christ child and of his coming in dark times fill our hearts this Christmas season. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all, now and for evermore. Amen.